I, I, I am Marco Pierani and uh, um, I have the pleasure and honor to, to chair this, uh, this session um, with distinguished speakers. Um, the, just to take this time and uh, uh, wait that everybody will express their choice and join the room that they have chosen. Maybe I will uh, just share some uh, rule of the games. We have four speakers, uh, four presentations and uh, uh, we will dedicate uh, some time uh, um, more more or less 12 minutes for each presentation and uh, um, uh, of course it will be possible for from the audience to uh, raise question uh, by uh, rise uh, uh, you, rising your hands through the bottom uh, uh, below uh, this will be for the at the end of the four presentation. Meanwhile, you can also use the uh, chat button to um, send your question, and we will try to take uh, your question to generate a debate. At the end of the four presentation, I will try to uh, steer, if possible, um, a more uh, a dynamic uh, uh, debate among the uh, the, the four. Uh, uh, speakers and also with intervention from the audience uh, if uh, there are. I believe there were already pretty many uh, insight and uh, interesting uh, uh, point uh, given by the, uh, um, the speakers and the organizer uh, until now. I take the chance also to thank uh, uh, both uh, uh, International Institute of Communication and AGICOM for organizing this, uh, this event and uh, to um, Commissioner Jomi and uh, Augusto Preta for asking me also to, <laughs> to, to chair this, uh, this panel. I accept it because it's, uh, the approach is very much uh, uh, of a lateral thinking and uh, it's new for me also to have this approach. Of course, we have to take into that in the in the, the speakers before uh, they already mentioned the uh, pending proposal that at European level uh, the European Commission put forward with DSA and DMA. Uh, they have already been mentioned. I want I would like to add on that also data governance act. It's very much important, uh, but we are not going to focus on regulation directly in this uh, in this panel we are going to try to understand which are those uh, uh, benefit coming from uh, um, uh, social network and platform that are not uh, uh, completely uh, clear to us that can be benefit for individual person or uh, for the uh, collective uh, for the society in general as a matter of fact, and just to uh, shut up and give the floor uh, to the first uh, um, presenters, uh, one last point I would like to share with you is that, uh, of course, we are speaking about uh, a, a virtual world, but where we are uh, spending more and more of our real life. So it's virtual, but it's very real. And I would call it more immaterial that, than, uh, than virtual, just to be uh, clear. There we spend uh, a lot of our life. Uh, our son and, and daughter will spend their life. So we need to try to build as a, a robust experience uh, and uh, a collective uh, society as, uh, as possible. That said, I will give the floor to the first uh, presenters uh, uh, and so to professor, uh, two professors uh, from the University uh, of Bergamo. And uh, by the way, I am from Bergamo as well. So I mean, this is a coincidence. And um, uh, Professor Francesca Pasquali, full professor of media studies, uh, uh, Department of Letters, Philosophy and Communication at the University of Bergamo and Professor uh, Roberta um, Bartoletti, full professor of so sociology of cultural and communication department of communication. 
at the University of uh, Urbino. So, um, Roberta and Francesca, please, uh, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, thank you. Um, my colleague is not arrived yet. She's having some problems. So I'm going to start and I'm going to share my, my uh, she was supposed to do that. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, I hope everything is working. Can you see my yes, presentation? Yes, we see okay. your presentation. It, it's not full screen. I'm sorry. Okay, I can. Um, Okay, this is full screen. Okay, thank you. And thank you um, for the introduction and I'm glad to be here. And uh, so uh, what are we going to present today? Uh, we are present a small part of a bigger research uh, um, devoted to um, quite a peculiar topic, which is uh, um, uh, death, uh, death and the, ch the changes that uh, uh, Italian people are exper experiencing uh, in uh, this in this field. Um, our presentation is based on a bigger um, research, uh, which is a national research uh, um, on the topic of death, dying, and disposal in Italy. Uh, research is a national research uh, coordinated by Asher Colombo uh, from um, the University of Bologna. And um, it, the research is based on uh, a survey we have done uh, between the 2018 and 2019, um, and uh, uh, alongside with 400 in-depth interviews because with Italian families, so it's a, a really big uh, field of research. Uh, we are not going to talk about the research in itself, but we are going to focus our presentation on uh, the part Roberta and I have, have been working on, which is a part on the role of digital media and platform. Hi, Roberta. Uh, digital media and platforms uh, uh, play uh, in this change, um, in this uh, new um, way to um, uh, relate to death and uh, rituals connected to death. Um, our theoretical framework is related to the literature focusing on mediatization and platformization for everyday life. It's a, a quite big literature um, with different focuses uh, um, like digital wheels or social media profiles and memorialization and digital afterlife, which is are very connected to the platformization part of the literature. And um, another focus, of course, is everyday life and everyday practices and how uh, the, the platforms uh, um, enter within the, the uh, this, uh, this field. Uh, we're going to talk about that today. Um, so um, the, the idea is to, uh, to uh, outline uh, from one side some unintended benefits of platform and on the other side some unintended or unexpected problems that are arising within this specific topic. So uh, um, we have two focuses here. Uh, one, one, um, the first one is on, on online that announcement. Um, our research and the literature uh, highlight that uh, uh, within the social body, there is a huge uh, um, uh, number of uh, co very codified and very and highly codified the social practices relating to how to report that and how to to um, participate um, to um, the, the grief and like uh, giving condolences or whatever. Um, some of those practices are migrating online, and so there is a, a this specific field of research which is um, which is focused on online dead announcement, uh, uh, we can call them ODAs, and uh, which are in a way are a kind of remediation to use a very well known uh, category uh, put into the debate by uh, Bolter of uh, traditional social practices like uh, funeral announcement or, um, or obituaries or uh, posters or um, something that we very codified. Uh, under this specific uh, um, point of view, two uh, benefits uh, uh, emerge from uh, our interviews. The first one is a kind of instrumental benefit, and the other one is more relational. Uh, the, the instrumental benefit is uh, um, 
connected to the idea that a lot of people expressed, uh, saying that uh, ODAs are easiest, are fastest, and they are cheapest. It's uh, it's very pragmatic to say, but uh, funeral rituals are very very expensive, and in a way, platform provide the easiest and cheapest way to perform them. Uh, another another benefit is connected to uh, as more a relational um, focus, and um, this benefit is connected to the idea that uh, social pro um, that platforms and social media um, help help people to reach everyone. No one is forgotten, and. At the same time, not only no one is forgotten, but uh, um, everyone can be reconnected in a way because uh, uh, platforms and uh, social networks uh, can, um, can um, put together people that lifetimes and uh, or um, the, the place where they, where they live as uh, disconnected. So um, they can provide a, a new shared space for grief. Mm -hmm. Of course, not everyone wants to be rich or, or and not everyone is interested in receiving this kind of announcement and Roberta is going to explore this, this side of the, of the question. The other benefit we have seen is unintended benefit, we, we have seen it probably is the deeper one, is connected to um, what is the real taboo in our society, which is not death. Uh, the the well-known thesis of the, um, the, um, the, the idea that death is something which is uh, uh, no more uh, present in society, uh, it, it's not so true, which is what is the real taboo in our society is grief. Is, is to show, to manifest grief. Um, so the, the people is isolated, but the, under this specific point of view, of view. And our research confirmed that grieving is, is just partially de legitimate in Italy. And that because it is perceived as a very intimate ma matter, with, as something which cannot be show off. Mm -hmm. So, from this specific point of view, platforms provide something really new because they provide a, a, a space for grieving public, a space where to be free to grieve, a, a space where to reconnect the personal with the social. And our interview said that this new space is, is some, something that somehow um, help them in healing the, the pain connected to um, the loss of the people that they care about. But again, the question is, is everything is black or white or, or is more now, uh, or there are more nuances as uh, Elisa Jomi said in her presentation in the plenary. Um, <clears throat> so the question is, are platforms really place appropriate or safe or completely safe place for grieving? So Roberta is going to <laughs> continue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Um, there is many problems connected to grieving online. Uh, the first one is that social norm conceive grieving uh, as a, an intimate and private matter are extended to uh, social networks and online environment. So mourning online is often accused of being a, a mere ostentation of pain or suffering, as uh, uh, an interviewee said uh, to us. You are just playing the victim if you grieve online. Um, the next one, Francesca. Yeah, please, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, the next. Okay, and we have, uh, um, many, many problems or ambivalences connected to the unintended, uh, unexpected benefits. Uh, for example, uh, not all times and places are appropriate to give or receive the new of the death because, because uh, 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 there are opportunity and etiquette and uh, there, is also, uh, there is also the problem of uh, dislocation, spatial and, and time dislocation connected to the affordances of the platforms. Uh, for example, uh, receiving a, a message uh, um, of, of, uh, of a death uh, when you are getting off the tram or uh, 
receiving comments uh, that are un inappropriate from people who don't know that uh, a person uh, is, uh, is dead. Um, concerning the, the, the benefit of Ex, um, of uh, to have to have the have the opportunity to express grief online. Um, another problem is that not everyone wants to be involved in in, in the suffering on, of of, of uh, social network use, users uh, because uh, uh, they are perceived as being mainly for fun, for ent entertainment. Uh, another problem, not everyone is entitled to speak in the same way in uh, remembering or in suffering in grieving online for a, this, um, for a dead. So uh, also in social networks, there are conflicts on memory and on remembering. Uh, there are also problems concerning the affordances of the platforms. Um, there are many um, problems of um, uh, quantification. Uh, we we have some extract. Uh, uh, some people say, uh, but you could just be a, uh, it could just, it could just be a way of getting some likes or some comment to collect likes. Uh, also, when grieving online, and uh, some uh, interviewees underline the inappropriateness of reaction buttons. Uh, so <laughs> uh, we, we wondered uh, how users uh, cope uh, with uh, these problems when grieving online. Uh, and we discovered that users use different tactics, uh, uh, tactics to protect the intimacies uh, of grieving uh, online. For example, using a cryptic communication uh, so that uh, those uh, who need to know, know. Uh, or uh, users, uh, um, use uh, creatively the, the platform affordances and they uh, communicate privately with the dead. For example, using uh, the private messenger uh, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. We have an, an example, um, a, a, a young female uh, send a message on messenger to uh, a, a friend who, who is dead. So not in public, privately. <laughs> uh, so, to conclude, uh, we, we wonder if uh, platforms could or should protect users from unexpected risk when grieving online, or are users' tactics uh, and strategies the best ways to protect their online grieving? So could platform protocols or guidelines uh, be useful for, for users through grieving etiquette or some also or other uh, instrument. So <laughs> thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much to, to both of you, uh, Francesca and Roberta. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a dimension that I have uh, personally not explored before. And I think it's a very new study also. And so uh, it's interesting your challenge here and also your open question, because I think you don't come with the final solution, but you, you, you open a, a question to be discussed. So maybe um, maybe already with the audience today, there are uh, questions. If there is an urgent question, I would take it uh, now. Instead, we will take it uh, for the end uh, um, with that, having a, a more general debate with, other, with the other colleagues that they will uh, uh, speak. Uh, after after you. So if there is anybody that want to jump in, please. If not, uh, but please take in your um, uh, Francesca and Roberta. Uh, maybe just consider how to try to uh, focalize on some of the aspects in the second round uh, that we will uh, uh, do afterward. Okay, so. Uh, Death uh, and social media first. Uh, now we are going to uh, jump on another uh, um, subject. Uh, the, and Professor Carolina uh, Bandinelli, uh, Associate Professor in Media and Creative Industry, or Work or Warwick uh, Center for Media, Culture and Political Studies, uh, will bring us to explore the world of dating and the, uh, I believe, uh, positive and uh, negative eff effect that this uh, 
having the experience say, on the basis of your of your study and uh, we are listening to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. Thanks everybody who's here and thank you to Elisa Jomi for having invited me. I'm very happy we start an afternoon with Eros and Thanatos or Thanatos and Eros, uh, uh, death and love, what's best to tackle the question of digital culture and digital sociality. Now I'm gonna share my screen. It's always a difficult moment for me. So please give me all your support while I try to share my screen. Okay, I think, does it work? Wait, wait a sec, wait a sec. Um, can you see it? Do you see my presentation? Perfectly okay. Really? Wow. Uh, yeah, maybe not in the in the presentation mode. Uh, but yeah, enlarge. but now it is. Now it's perfect. So Fantastic. you see, you manage, and this is we are all happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's great. It's a great achievement for for a social professor in media. It's uh, it's really good. Um, I earned my title today. Okay, uh, so um, today I'm going to talk about um, dating apps and the digital culture of love. And I think this is a topic that may be even more urgent and perhaps interesting, especially. Uh, since we are living in a global pandemic. And apparently, um, during the first and second lockdown, um, there was a dramatic surge in the use of uh, dating apps throughout the world. And this may appear a bit counterintuitive because if you cannot go out, if you cannot meet anybody, then why do you need a dating app? And uh, as everything has been digitized, perhaps love and sexuality are increasingly being digitized and the pandemic has indeed, as I said, accelerated this process, uh, then we may be witnessing and experiencing, uh, um, if not a revolution, uh, surely a remediation of some of the um, spheres that pertain to our experience of love and uh, and uh, um, sexuality. Indeed, um, the users of dating apps are increasing constantly. There are some figures there if you want to have a look. And uh, there is an increasing interest uh, uh, by both the academic uh, and uh, the uh, general public. Now, as it is often the case, um, we can see that the debate is relatively polarized between uh, those that support the um, positive, emancipatory, empowering uh, effects of dating apps and those that might denounce that, in fact, denounce uh, uh, the negative effects. So in this presentation, I'm trying to sort of not necessarily take side, but what I want to do is try to question or deconstruct some widespread common sense in both academia and outside academia when it comes to uh, dating apps. Um, what I'm going to say has to be contextualized within a cultural study of uh, love. So, Quite briefly, where we are at when it comes to the culture of love in Western neoliberal society. Well, we live in a society and culture in which love has been liberated so that we don't have to obey the morale of traditional institutions. I think about the family, the church, when it comes to our love and sexual choices. In fact, we are free to choose. And this freedom has been again, I would say remediated or co-opted, uh, depending of uh, where you want to stand politically, by the logic of the neoliberal market, which means by a notion of uh, market freedom, or better yet, entrepreneurial freedom. So there is a sense in which it is your own choice uh, to 
find the perfect relationship and the bar is quite high. Uh, you must find the pure relationship uh, that combine uh, uh, sexual chemistry and emotional intimacy with cohabitation, but also individual freedom. So we live in a society in which we are, we are constantly facing this dilemma when it comes to love. How do I choose well enough to meet this very high demand. And if I fail to choose, then it might well be that it's my fault. And then we have the whole plethora of how-to books uh, and you know, BuzzFeed psychology to fix a self that seems to always fall short from the expectation. And when it comes to love and sexuality, um, this also means that love is no more a matter of transgressing the social order, of doing something quite different to what you are told to do. Um, I'm aware of simplifying, but 10 minutes, I mean, we, we need to simplify things. Um, but actually, love and sexuality are quite an injunction. So we live in, a, in our contemporary Western culture, uh, there is a constant injunction of finding love and having an adventurous sexual life. So this is where we are at. Um, choice is the most difficult thing. So within this context, we can interpret the rise of dating apps as uh, um, related to, connected to the provision of devices to navigate choice. Um, according to Avi Lutz, uh, dating apps um, can be seen as technologies of choice, indeed. So, in a sense, they reproduce the market fiction of comparable objects, comparable objects of desire, and um, so allegedly giving the possibility to operate an autonomous, free, informed choice. Well, on the other hand, especially the apps that work with the matching algorithm, uh, they partially relieve the responsibility from the subject and, um, and, and, and they place it uh, into the, the technology, the algorithm. So again, to draw any villus, uh, we can see how dating apps kind of, uh, you know, very much exemplify and epitomize the algorithms called in intimacy, this idea of efficiency, this idea that we can find a rationality of, uh, um, we, we can find the rationality within love. There is a system that we can crack. And so we can see how this can be very relieving for a subject that is has this pressing responsibility of doing the right choice on uh, their shoulder. And here's just an image from Hang the Vision, an episode of Black Mirror, that I think very much exemplifies this fantasy of love as something that can be made into a rational, algorithmically driven system, finally relieving us from choice. Now, the problem is that it doesn't quite work like that, uh, according to my um, observation. And uh, I've been studying uh, these dating apps culture for, uh, for a few years now. And uh, I do very like hyper qualitative uh, um, sociological um, studies. So from what I've observed, uh, uh, this is not quite the case. Uh, in fact, for the users, for most users, the logic of their algorithm is quite obscure. So that uh, uh, the vignette that I'm going to offer um, you today is that of the friend that comes to you saying, hey, who the hell the algorithm thinks I am? Do the algorithm really think I am that kind of person? Do we match with that kind of people? So there is a sense in which we also um, position ourselves in a sort of a confrontational, um, position vis-a-vis -vis the algorithm. Um, what is obscure at the more, you know, perhaps at a deeper level is what is that the algorithm know about myself that I don't know? 
And what is that the algorithm want? And do we want the same thing? Well, arguably not, because uh, in fact, uh, dating apps to survive as a business, because after all, they are part of an industry, they don't need you to find Mr. or Mrs. Right. Um, and this is this is the first the first uh, point, which um, don't get me wrong, I don't think this is a negative effect necessarily. I think it points at the fact that uh, not everything can be subsumed and co-opted within an algorithm. So there is always something that escapes this logic. And in the relationship that subjects have with the algorithm um, shortcomings, uh, perhaps is this residual uh, that uh, sort of emerge. The other problem is that it's a lot of Babylonia. Dating apps are really are a place where the absence, uh, sorry for the typo, of shared scripts is very much noticeable. So there are people that respond to very different romantic codes and sexual cultures, uh, and this creates the potential for a lot of misunderstanding. Finally, meeting people may be quite difficult. In fact, the idea that dating apps just replicates and hook up culture where there is an abundance of sex and, uh, and sexual and, and, and romantic experiences is quite a myth. Quite a lot of people are on dating apps and don't want to meet anybody or don't manage to meet anybody. Hence, the apps don't work, except they do. Um, and so what I want to focus on is the non-obvious ways in which dating apps work. And I mean, non-obvious perhaps is an assumption, right? But definitely not obvious in that they at least partially challenge the common sense of dating apps as um, apparatuses for a hookup culture dominated by efficiency. Let's put it this way. So the first thing that I want to draw your attention to is that dating apps work as uh, uh, devices uh, for accumulating and projecting social status. And also as devices again, uh, to engage with one's desire and fantasy in a way that makes the app itself a libidinal object. And then they also can be seen as technology of the sexual self, as spaces where sexual selves can be performed. And I'm going to say just something more about these three aspects. So the first one, um, accumulating and projecting social status. So um, the, the findings of my research points at the fact that dating apps allow to access the social dimension of love and sex, meaning they allow you to talk about love and sex without the need of an actual date. So in this respect, they enable the subject to respond to the social injunction of having this love and an adventurous love and sexual life without having an embodied encounter without the need of an actual date there is it allows to engage with the discursive and imaginary dimension of uh, love and sex and, uh, and, and and we can see this is quite ambivalent because on the one hand it allows the subject to negotiate to a social demand um, and then on the other hand, of course, it leaves us with the question of the body. This is a very disembodied social dimension of love and sex. Um, the second, um, let's say, aspect that I that I want to that I want to bring up today is uh, that. Uh, while we engage with dating apps and we can create, we can participate and access this uh, social discursive dimension of love and sex, uh, we do develop an attachment to the app itself as an erotic object, as a libidinal object. And this I think applies to dating apps and also to other apps. I mean, it's sufficient to think how difficult it is not to hold your phone. Um, and when it comes to dating apps, this is even more evident. The way we relate to the app, we are seduced by the app 
because it's within the app itself that realizes this horizon of possibilities in the case of dating apps when it comes to love and sex. But I think this can be applied also to other apps. So in a sense, we are witnessing a paradoxical overturn in which instead of relating to others by means of the app, we might relate to the app by means of other. And there is a form of perhaps a decentralization of subjectivity that perhaps sheds light on something um, that has to do with our relationship with um, technological objects. And then the third dimension is that dating apps, and um, I hope at least someone can get the citation of Justin Timberlake, um, they bring in sexy back, but without the body. So what I noticed in my uh, latest uh, uh, observations and interviews, et cetera, is that dating apps, they offer an interstitial space where a sexualized self can be performed. So drawing on Foucault, we can think of dating apps as technology of sexualization, that, that space that allows the subject to engage with their own fantasies. And fantasies, and here I'm talking about sexual fantasies, are very much accessible. Also in a way that can be quite empowering or that can make possible what otherwise would have been impossible, extremely difficult. And I'm gonna um, just share with you another vignette uh, that of a um, young uh, woman in the South of Italy coming from a peripheral area. Um, that at some point started wondering whether she might like women instead of men. But there was no, you know, a gay scene in the in the in the villa she lives with, uh, she lived in. And uh, and and so having Tinder and being able to just you know switch the um preference allowed her to see if she might like women in fact, if she might enjoy a erotic conversation with, with another woman in a way that it's very, very easy. It's very, it's very much accessible. Um, and another interesting, or perhaps at least for me, interesting uh, uh, vignette is um, that it seems that um, once someone is turned 18, so it's allowed to um, join dating apps, uh, uh, it's a bit of a ritual of passage. Oh, finally. I can download the dating apps. And, and then the dating apps become really a site of performance of this sexual set that is also very gamified. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah, I think these all kind of raise more questions than, than answer, but I think these may be three lines of uh, uh, possible inquiry when it comes to the question, okay, what are dating apps doing uh, or you know, how we relate to dating apps and, and the broader question of what is a digital culture of love. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Carolina. Um, it's um, three points that maybe we can jump on again at the end to explore uh, also comments, but if there are any urgent uh, question or remark now from the audience, I would take it now together with Carolina, of course. If not, we go to the next uh, uh, speaker. My, my, my comment, but I will, uh, I will try to make a debate. Uh, this is, uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm, uh, it's strange that questions are not rising because I think there are a lot of questions. What, one of uh, maybe just an intermediate question before to, to go to the other panelists. Um, uh, your, uh, your study is, uh, uh, has been conducted also by uh, interviewing and do you, can you give a, a dimension of it's a I believe a qualitative and not quantitative, uh, but can you give a little bit of the dimension of the study we are speaking about? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, 
Well, I conducted various, um, perhaps four iteration. Um, so uh, the more the, the the most recent one I did this summer, I interviewed forty people, and uh, in the UK and Italy, but mostly in the UK, and uh, um, there wasn't there weren't parameters about you know gender and uh, sexual orientations, but uh, there was an age. Uh, threshold so people under 40 quite a few of them were um, university students so there's always this sort of you know cultural capital kind of class bias in this uh, in this research and um, then there was another iteration conducted two years ago and I conducted four focus groups and uh, I think about yeah, 20 qualitative interviews. And the demographic is pretty much the same. And they were mostly in London and in the north of England. And then in the first iteration, I conducted another four focus groups and uh, interviewed, I think perhaps 15 people. Also, I do these within the scope of an ethnographic field work. So a lot of these data are also taken from informal interactions with participants. Perfect. I, I ask you because, I mean, we didn't have the experience uh, with our consumer uh, organization in Italy, Atroconsumo, we made uh, a study some time ago, but not uh, on this social aspect, but more on the possible violation of privacy on, or uh, other, other aspect uh, in uh, the dating apps. And there are other experiences around, uh, I think in Norwegian, there was also a, a study on, on that, but more on the really consumer aspect, uh, let's say, because there are also that aspect that can be point of attention uh, in different yeah. platforms and also in, in dating apps, uh, especially uh, because uh, your uh, individuality can be taken by somebody else or can somebody can appear as you if there are there are privacy violations, but maybe we can jump on that. Uh, yeah, uh, no, of course. I mean, I've 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 proposed a very um, a very specific kind of narrative, and there are all sorts of okay. other issues and and uh, and topics. So when it comes when it comes to dating apps and privacy, it's one, and sexual harassment is uh, definitely another one. Deception uh, is surely another one. Um, so yes. Definitely. Thank you. Marco. Marco. Ah, Elisa, of oh, course. Yes. yes sorry. Please. Uh, I hope it's not uh, unpolite uh, if I jump in, but uh, no, please. I promised I would move in between panels, so I have to leave. And I just wanted to make two very uh, short remarks uh, on Carolina's and Francesca and Roberta's presentation, if I may. Sorry. Um, uh, Carolina. Um, it's always a, a pleasure to listen to you and uh, please be aware that the, but you are for sure that the process started long before apps um, with self-help books and makeover shows television makeover shows in uh, you know those intended to help you um, rework your relationship with your partner and how to um, properly choose your partner and so forth and I was impressed by the fact that the same rhetoric of choice um, underneath which the uh, stigmatization of bad choice lie. The same rhetoric uh, accompanies uh, uh, these uh, uh, tools, uh, uh, such as self-help books and makeover shows, uh, as well as dating apps somehow. So there is the same uh, neoliberalism construction 
of uh, uh, apparently uh, tools that are intended to empower you and to widen your uh, choices, but uh, uh, underneath which this uh, um, tendency to blame people who are not able to make the proper choice uh, lay. So there is a, a source of parallelism in between. I hope I will have the time to talk about this to you because uh, <laughs> I have not expressed it uh, as I intended to, but I am sure you understood the, 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 uh, the kernel. And uh, um, as far as Roberta and Fran Francesca's presentation is concerned, uh, probably is uh, very basic as a comment, but um, I was uh, impressed by uh, your research because I uh, thought that um, the main, the first and main um, indirect benefit uh, of uh, um, grieving online on social networks uh, was represented by the fact that uh, social networks were devised, were originally devised to help creating and ma maintaining bonds with living people. Mm -hmm. So uh, no one could have expected that uh, social network would be used in order to creating and maintaining bonds with dead people which is impressive in anthropological term. And also uh, you made this, uh, there was a, a participant making this question, why do people feel the need to uh, tell Margie, I miss you, just to let everyone know knows that they miss this person. Uh, when I was reading, I, I thought that, uh, well, um, this use of social network is not uh, only a simple uh, homage, a tribute to someone who is dead. It is uh, a sort of attempt to use social network to talk with the dead person. When I, when I say, I miss you, I'm not talking to uh, a generalized audience. No, I'm trying to talk with this person and I kind of, ask this generalized audience, this sort of general intellect, to testimony to my will and desire to go on talking with this person as if he or she could live again throughout this, <laughs> this general intellect gathering on social network. I'm, I'm kind of working in a, 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 it's imagination, pure imagination, but I was very stimulated by this presentation. Thank you so much. I don't know if there is time for you to reply. Probably no, probably Marco has to rush. Uh, Elisa, given, thank you very much because I believe it's important to have this uh, lively uh, debate. This is also the, when you have such presentation, I believe there is the urgency to really comment and uh, and thank you very much to jump on this. And so I I, I would give the, 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 the floor back to, to Carolina and Roberta and Francesca maybe shortly if they can react on these uh, very interesting comments from your side. Well, first of all, thank you, Elisa, for your comments. Yes, I mean, I think that this centrality of the self on the one hand, and at the same time, centrality of the self that is empowering and humiliating at the same time is one of the core paradigm of the neoliberal ideology. So it could be seen in love, it could be seen when it comes to mental health, it could be seen in the culture of food, you know, you don't eat well enough, hence uh, you have problems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and there is definitely a dimension in which dating uh, has to do with this better version of yourself. And, and what you were mentioning, like the um, uh, makeover shows, I think they're also part of, uh, I mean, you make me think of dating shows because I think that now in parallel with the uh, rise of dating apps, there is also a rise of dating shows. There are so many, you know, Netflix recently released one in which people are dressed like furries, they're like dressed like puppies. And then there's one in which people meet themselves naked. And then there's one in which uh, people are matched by an Indian matchmaker. And that, and so on and so forth. So I think there is a 
there is something about the popular culture of dating and finding these uh, ways uh, to make things work uh, that, that it's interesting. So um, I hope we can carry, carry on this conversation. Oh, very quickly, quickly. Uh, thanks, uh, Elisa. Uh, yes, uh, social networks are one of the most appropriate places uh, uh, for continuing bonds uh, with the dead, but uh, there are very, very many uh, problems and st stigmatization also for people who, who, who try to, to continue uh, to, 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 to maintain an interaction with the dead uh, uh, online. <laughs> so many nuances <laughs> and ambivalences. So thank you. Francesca, do you want to? Yeah, very, very quickly, but it, um, yeah, it, it is also true that there is this um, incredible feeling of intimacy, uh, as Elisa was saying. Now, you, so you address it through you address as someone who is not here anymore with uh, directly, and at the same time you're doing it in public. So it, it, it's very, it's very complicated. It's very layered and uh, um, very nuanced <laughs> again. I believe just to to I mean because there are many uh, many points of uh, that also brings me to have some comment. I, I believe we have uh, experienced I mean to um, the, the society and our individuality and also in terms of collective society we have experienced a relation for uh, for millennium uh, in a certain, in a different dimension in in the in the in, in the traditional dimension. This is very new in terms of uh, lifespan of collective experience. So I believe we are really in an early phase and I believe still the society is, is uh, not prepared to get uh, all the benefit out of this new, new kind of uh, relation. Of course, trying to put down as much as possible the risk and the uh, collateral uh, negative, uh, ne negative aspect. So that, that's, that brings me back, not because Elisa is here, but just to say that it, it was a very good choice to, to, to try to bring here also uh, the possibility of uh, discussing together on, the, uh, on picking up uh, positive, positive, positive uh, effects uh, and collateral positive effects. I believe it's just the starting point on, on, on this. And probably it's not each of us can have a, a, a personal or individual experience, but the challenge is to find a framework in the, in, in the society, not only through regulation, but also not written way of uh, approaching this new opportunity to get uh, the most out of that uh, for, for, uh, for, for the benefit of, uh, of the society. If that does not bring other comments, which can be the case. Uh, um. Can I make a comment? I would just yes. like We have to... other two speakers, but I mean, yes, of course. Ah, okay, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, but please go. No, but it's super quick. Uh, just to Robert and Francesca, if they watch that episode of Black Mirror, which I think is called Polar Bear or something, when there is basically an avatar with an artificial intelligence that replicates the um, actions, that the, 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 the speech of the death, uh, the dead. And I think it's something that actually it's, it's, it's quite it's quite relevant. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, I know there are other people, but thanks. Okay, um, okay. Um, then I would jump uh, to uh, Giacomo uh, Lev Manheimer, head of government, uh, uh, government uh, relation and public policy, Southern Europe of TikTok. So we go. Uh, to uh, a, re a representative of uh, another uh, platform uh, and we are here to listen to to you. Giacomo, are you here? Yes. Yeah, thank you, okay. Marco. Um, uh, the, the thing is that I have an issue with my with my video in the sense that I'm unable to start the video because the host has stopped it for some reason. So uh, ah, if they can okay. help. Oh, yeah. Now, now 
they alert me. Okay, here you ah, are. You are there. You are there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So first of all, thanks thanks to to Agicom and to the to the International Institute of Communication for the invitation. Thanks also to the speaker who preceded me. Uh, your speeches were very interesting. I have learned a lot more than I can contribute. And and thanks also to to Marco for introducing me. Um, so. I believe the topic of the conference is really inspiring and perfectly in line with what we try to build every day in TikTok. And I think there is one word in particular that many marketers especially have attributed to TikTok and that I sincerely believe describes how it works. And that word is serendipity. And it's a term that comes from serendip, uh, which was the ancient uh, Persian name of Sri Lanka. And it was coined like uh, 400 years ago. Um, so it has a long history. Um, and it was coined by uh, uh, an, a writer that, that was called Horace Walpole that wrote this fairy tale called The Three Princes of Serendip. And basically in this fairy tale, the, uh, the three protagonists find on their path a series of random clues which save them from dangers. And so serendipity is in short, a lucky and unplanned discovery. And this thing, a lucky and unplanned discovery is exactly the feeling of, oh, that we try to elicit in our users when they open TikTok. Now, TikTok mission has always been to inspire creativity and bring good humor. Um, and it was designed, can you hear me? Mark, yes, we stop, can. But you, we can. Ah, sorry, sorry, because I saw Marco like stopped his video like suddenly. Okay, so I was saying, um, in TikTok there is a central role of the content. The content is at the center of TikTok and not the relationship between its users. And this is like probably the main difference between TikTok and any other platform. Um, this creates an environment where creativity has a much greater weight than the user's celebrity or his circle of friends. Uh, this setting guides the entire user experience on TikTok. I don't know how many of you have ever used TikTok, but if you often it, you already have videos and you have videos that are made from people that probably you don't even know and that you don't follow that are not your friends. Um, this ensures that content is interesting and relevant for you. And especially this breaks the traditional bubble effect of having, you know, like content that is only generated by your friends or circle of friends or friends of all your friends. So to keep TikTok feed interesting and varied, our recommendation system works to basically offer diverse types of content along with those that the person already loves. So sometimes on TikTok, you may come across a video in your feed that doesn't appear to be relevant to your expressed interest or, or that have amassed uh, like a small number of likes, but in, in, in a way you are like a test for that content to, to, for the platform to define it, if that content is worth to be uh, proposed to other uh, users or not. So, and this is because while a video is likely to receive more views if posted by an account that has more followers by virtue of that account having built up a larger follower base. That being said, neither follower account nor whether the, the account has had other high performing videos are factors in the recommendation system. So this means the visibility, the virality of the videos on TikTok are not determined by the number of followers that you have, or the fact that uh, who posted that video uh, has you know, done other successful videos in the past. This is uh, an important and intentional component of our approach to recommendation, because this brings a diversity of videos into everyone's personal feed. Uh, and in this way gives people opportunities to stumble upon new content categories, discovering new creators, and experiencing new perspectives and ideas as they scroll through their feed. Um, now, uh, now th like this, I think is the most probably even interesting and the strength of TikTok uh, 
because these uh, creates the ability of our community to develop their potential because it's really so easy to become viral if your content is interesting and well done. Uh, you don't need to really like build a massive uh, you know, follower base to become viral. And these produce relevant trends within TikTok, uh, but sometimes and increasingly often, hopefully, uh, also huge and unexpected phenomena, so to speak, in the real world. Now, I could give many examples, but uh, let me give you one, which I think is the most, the most significant, or at least my favorite, which is BookTok. Now, BookTok is a hashtag, nothing more, nothing less. It is the hashtag that all people on TikTok use when it comes to books, reading, writing, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so you have book reviews, writing tips, plot reenactments of popular novels, and more. And this corner of TikTok uh, inspires others to really enjoy literature and books uh, in, in all its forms. And the BookTok community has been on TikTok since, since early 2020. And so an enormous boost during March of 2020 with the beginning of stay-at-home orders. Now, uh, users turned to TikTok probably in the same way in which they turned to Tinder as per the uh, presentation before mine um, for, for entertainment. They discovered BookTok recommendations and, then, and so that they reignite a passion for reading that has grown through the app and has, have inspired like literally billions of videos, like this hashtag alone has over 30 billion views, which is huge. And the impact of BookTok has also reached already uh, international success out of the platform. This happened at first when a Japanese TikTok creator who is called Kengo, basically he posted a video introducing uh, a novel that is called Lipstick on the After Image, which was a book originally released in 1989. And I have to say like from that time, mainly, you know, gone in the obscure world of nobody reading it or at least uh, buying anymore. Now the video's comments section of this video became a discussion board and led this novel to become like ranked among the top books on so many online shopping sites and sold over 100,000 copies in two weeks. And this process has repeated itself over, over the last year. Uh, there are many books like The Song of Achilles, We Were Liars. There are countless books that experience this phenomenon. Uh, and this is part of the reason why also uh, very important uh, stores like Barnes & Noble have book talk tables near the entrance where they sell the, you know, like the most, uh, the most famous uh, books that they found on TikTok. Other bookstores have joined that community um, and add book recommendation, bookstore comedies, memberships, blah, 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 and also news new releases. And, and this stores use TikTok to show, also, to show also the fun side of a bookstore, bookstore life. And they encourage potential readers to explore their physical stores uh, beyond TikTok. Now, on the book published publishing side, uh, Penguin Random House, for example, is very in tune with book talk trends and frequently collaborates with creators. They run out all aspects of the book industry found on TikTok or take Blasbury, uh, that is a, is a publishing house based in Britain that uh, recently reported record sales uh, and, and, and record profits and their CEO, Nigel Newton, uh, put down this success partly to what he described as the absolute phenomenon of book, of book talk. Um, and, or you can, can consider that on Amazon, book talk is so influential that it has leapt into the titles of books themselves. So there is a novel that was called It Ends With Us and is now listed as It Ends With Us, TikTok Made Me Buy It. And so overall, this is to say that Books are among the oldest form of environment of entertainment, and TikTok is among the newest form of entertainment. So this already makes it uh, quite an interesting uh, uh, cultural uh, mix. And 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 book talk, you know, has been able just as a hashtag produced by the community without without any input from us uh, to really delight book fans and encourage others to take a break from watching and enjoy reading. 
And for those new to TikTok, this might be surprising, you know, to find such a vibrant literature community. Um, but this is actually just one of several communities of like-minded individuals that the app has fostered, leading to a widespread cultural impact on, on platform. And I believe these phenomena are, at the end of the day, uh, what, like probably the most interesting uh, positive unintended consequences that, that the platform uh, offers to, it, to its users. And oh, and, and if you're wondering, under the hashtag book talk, there are also reviews of the book, The Three Princes of Serendip, that I mentioned at the beginning of my speech. Thank you very much again. And any question, I'm very happy to, to answer. Thank you very much, Giacomo. Very interesting also your um, uh, sharing here. Um, I, I would ask to the, to the previous speaker to focus on uh, one minute last message at the end when we will have uh, listened also from Lubos uh, Kuklis that I will give the floor now. Maybe for you, Giacomo, given the fact that you have uh, uh, mentioned, of course, positive uh, collateral effect, maybe also to, given that you are the only representative of a platform here in the, among the speakers, also how, to, how you are handling instead in a, in a responsible way, possible instead negative collateral effect of your uh, platform. So if you can concentrate uh, on that uh, in the last uh, minute uh, that uh, I will give you, uh, to you after. So this brings me to um, uh, give the floor to Lubos uh, Kuklis, Chief Executive at the Council of Broadcasting and Retransmission of uh, Slovakia and chair of the European Platform of Regulatory Authority. I believe uh, I, I didn't align with, uh, with Lubos, but I believe um, given his uh, experience, probably here we go back to a more related regulation uh, uh, reflection uh, after these uh, uh, other approaches. But I mean, I leave it to, to you, Lubos, to, 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 to uh, to, to share your thought with us, please. Thank you very much, Marco. And indeed, I'm coming from regulatory environment and my intervention will be about regulation. And I, unfortunately, I was in another conference, so I, I couldn't listen to all the previous speakers, although I, I now uh, heard uh, Giacomo speaking, so at least that. And, and of course, if there will be any debate, I would very much uh, like to engage in that. And I'm, I'm, uh, I will, I'm trying to share now my, my screen uh for a presentation uh that is dealing sorry something is not right okay okay do you see it please yes okay perfect thank you very much and what i will be probably what, what i've heard uh, at least from the from the, the moment that i've been here is that maybe the connection pre with previous speakers will be uh, in and uh, what I've been talking, a new kind of triangle structure in, in the and the new regulation of digital environment, and which is relying on the user as another regulatory element included in, in that, that structure. So my my presentation is called the user of the platform and the regulator, and it is about the future of content regulation in a what I what I call triangular shape. So this means that in the lag analog past we experienced uh, the dichotomy. And, and media regulation between media that held all the responsibilities and all the rights uh, in the environment, responsible meaning uh, editorial responsibility, but also legal responsibility, and the, the rights uh, meaning you know, uh, media freedom, freedom of expression on the one side. And on the other, there was a regulator representing uh, public interest and uh, applying legislation via regulatory measures. Uh, now, now, in the, in the digital present, so to say, uh, we have a new regulatory element included in there, which is the user. The user is a main creator on, on the on the digital platforms, and also the rights now and respons responsibilities need to be uh, redistributed, so to say, between media and the user. Now, when we are talking about media, uh, we are meaning a new kind of media, what we are usually called digital platforms, but the names uh, changes with with the uh, with the author or, or with the legislation, and there was indeed a a thorough debate, an intensive debate 
whether when we are talking about platforms, are we talking about mere intermediaries who are who is just uh, which are just uh, distributing content, or are we talking about media? So what uh, th these were probably the two uh, two prongs of the debate. Now in the EU, we know at least partly the answer. Uh, until now, we had the uh, e-commerce directive that was declaring the platform's information society services uh, with limited liability. It meant uh, that if the, if the provisions are fulfilled, they are not liable for the content on the platforms. If those uh, conditions are not met, they may be liable. And now we're moving with new legislation toward video sharing platforms, which is uh, a new name uh, for the platforms that are carrying video content in the audiovisual media services directive and online platforms, which is the name given to the to the digital platforms carrying uh, the uh, the content in the Digital Service Act proposal, or uh, very big, on, on, uh, very large online platforms. Uh, that is the name for online platforms with uh, the, the the biggest size, so to say, within this act. So now now we have the answer in in the EU that. Uh, it, it is not, uh, uh, these digital platforms are not mere intermediaries, but they are not media either. There are a new kind of entity uh, with, uh, uh, and we have to uh, tailor the, the regulation around those new entities. And it is either video sharing platforms in the AVMSD or online platforms in the DSA. And there would be probably other uh, definitions in other uh, regulatory areas. Now, what is the characteristic of, the, of this new approach? And I, I would I would touch on on four of them. The first is that this kind of regulation is systemic. Uh, it means that uh, contrary to what we experience in the old world, so to say, uh, they are not resp responsible for every single item of the content that they are carrying on their services. They are responsible for systemic treatment of the content. Uh, they are uh, responsible for distribution and handling of the content when in violation with their or own, with their own terms of services, or for example, treatment of users that might be in violation of their terms of, of uh, services. Now there are three reasons I would say for that. One is practical; that is just too much content on the on the on the platforms to feasibly think about regulation of every single item of content. Uh, another reason is legal because with the e-commerce directive, as I mentioned already, there is a limited liability for the platforms, and this seems to be retained also in the Digital Services Act. So uh, legally, you can't make them liable for every single item of content. But there's also reason material in, on, the, on the substance, because this system of, of, uh, of treating, uh, this approach of treating uh, digital platforms and their responsibilities is also probably uh, the most suited to to properly balance the rights and interests of those that are meeting on the platform. So it's not only platforms and and the audience, so to say, but also the active users that are creating content and are, are uploading the content on the platforms themselves. Now, when we are talking about systemic regulation, it basically means that the first line of regulation lies with the platforms themselves. And this means that the uh, the first line of regulation needs to be implemented via their own terms of conditions. In AVMSD, this is obligatory. The regulatory measures that are written in the AVMSD are to be applied on the platforms via their own uh, terms and conditions. This is non-obligatory, so to say, in the DSA, but this is predominantly because the main uh, uh, part of the DSA is dealing with illegal content. There are spe specific procedures there around that, but in those parts that it is uh, touching upon, so to say, harmful content, which is a content less harmful than, than illegal, but still harmful uh, in, in the codes of conduct parts or, or in, in, in those uh, parts where we are talking about risk assessment of the, of, of, uh, the platforms themselves around harmful content. These measures need to be applied also via terms and conditions. Now, it also means that the uh, platforms are required to create tools for users. So there are to be actively participating, participating in more than just uploading the content there, but there are to be complaint mechanisms for them uh, to use when something is going wrong uh, from their perspective. There are flagging tools uh, that they can use for flagging some kind of content that might be potentially harmful or potentially in breach of the, of the rules of the platforms. 
and there are you know ver various obligations for the platforms to use explanations and to explain to the to the users what is going on why their content was taken down uh why uh, something was labeled such and such and so on and the fourth part very important one is around transparency because in the old media world transparency wasn't that important because you just switch on the tv and you've seen the broadcast and everything that was on there you know 24 hours a day this is not uh possible in the on the platforms because every user can have a different experience right so uh now there is a need for enhanced transparency and this is done by self-reporting but also risk assessments that are for example required by the dsa but you know in in a more enhanced manner also access to data and audits and verification which is probably the highest level of transparency where uh, independent authorities can verify what is going on on the platforms themselves and this can be done via uh, research and the access to data can be given to the researchers uh, that are independently or you know probably in academia but also in other other areas but also we can think about auditing intermediaries uh, a companies that are for example mentioned in the DSA that may may be making the uh, the verification of the data and auditing processes but also there is an idea about auditing authorities as a state or uh, ind independent authorities but you know state funded that can do these kind of uh, research and these kind of audits uh, for for uh, the media platforms now what about user in this triangle structure now, user, as I said, has, has, the, the, the dis redistribution, so to say, and rights and responsibilities is what is happening currently. And it is important that the, the, the rights, fundamental rights of the users are put into the equation when thinking about regulatory measures. And this recognition of, of rights is explicit in the ADMSD. It is explicit in the DSA. So it means that now when you are applying any kind of regulatory measure or the platform is applying you know, some kind of measure at the first line of regulation it needs to be thinking about rights and interests of the user. So uh, even from the constitutional pers perspective, so to say, it is just the, the user is not treated as a mere audience, a mere, you know, uh, recipient of the service, but as an active element of it. And it means that uh, the balancing processes and, you know, the, the legal term of proportionality where and, you know anything that might uh, might somehow infringe on, on on the rights of the users needs to be applied proportionality. Uh, that this this is being used here and now for for the legal uh, scholars and and the legal experts it is it is to find a proper way to do that. That's why there's a proportionality test written in on my slide with that question mark. And there are also tools now given to the users to actively participate also in the, so to say, regulatory uh, manner, uh, which is, uh, you know, about, I only mentioned complaint magazine, flagging statements of reasons by, reasons by the platforms, explanations when it comes to algorithms, how they behave and why the users are seeing the content that they are seeing and so on. And the last part of the triangle is the regulator. What is changing for him because of, of the changes in, in the environment and in the regulatory structure? Well, the data transparency itself calls for regulator being able uh, to work in, within that framework of transparency, to be able to gather the data, to be able to, to do the audits and to do the verification in the transparency procedures. Uh, there is a, a strong need for cooperation, either in co-regulatory co manner, because when we are talking about the systemic treatment or systemic approach to regulation, which means that the, the platforms are the first line of regulation. It also means that we are uh, in a kind of co-regulatory process where the platforms are applying the measures and the, uh, the regulators are verifying whether the, those measures have been applied uh, appropriately. But the cooperation is also cross-sectoral. It means that uh, various types of regulators need to work together, either it being uh, data protection or competition regulators and so on these regulators now need, need to uh, cooperate together in order to have a kind of holistic approach uh, to the digital environment and those actors that are working within that and also the cooperation needs to be cross-jurisdictional it means that a country of origin principle that is being applied also in the abmsd but also in the tsa for example means that the jurisdiction over certain kind of services 
have only one jurisdiction. So the, all the other regulators need to be able uh, to work together in, 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 in order to see the benefits from this, this legislation and the new legislation uh, in their member states. And also now the cooperation is also with the DSA coming in, is thinking about moving on the European level. So for example, on the member state level, we will have digital service coordinators that will be coordinating themselves then on the EU level within the EU board for digital services. So the cooperation is a strong element of the new regulatory environment. And another uh, strong part of that will be a new informational role, because again, because of the systemic approach, it means that probably the regulators will not be regulating that much, but will be uh, overseeing uh, the workings of the system. And maybe, maybe the better role, a better name for that is a governance, that will be a new governance structure within which the regulators will be only one element. But they will be very well placed to play an important informational role within the ecosystem. They will need to have a, their own research. They will need to be able to distribute the information that they will gathering. And they will have a much larger role in the media literacy. And another, uh, the fourth element is independence. This is something that is uh, reiterated uh, many times over in, in the media environment. But now the new legislation is also calling for that very important, uh, very uh, strongly. And this is the independence of the regulators. It is very strongly called for in the ABMSD, and it is a strong part of the DSA also. Now, the last thing I would like to <coughs> mention, and it is the graduated approach to regulation. I'm sorry, I've been, <coughs> I've been speaking so much today that <coughs> my voice is quite late. Sorry for that. Uh, so we are when we are talking about types of content that needs to be regulated, we are to, no, it's it's graduated. Illegal content is something that is very much in the focus of the DSA. Harmful content is something that is a partly in, uh, under, under DSA, but it's very much a uh, focus of the MMSD. But then there is also another kind of content, and I would, I'm, I'm, that is you know harmful a little bit, so to say, but that can make uh, wreak havoc in our democratic societies. And this information I'm using as, as a kind of uh, uh, example of that, because there, there's you know, many types of borderline content, so to say. And for that, we will have even less regulation, but will not be uh, the approach to that and how, to tr how we are treating that will not be uh, less important for that. So here we are talking much more about self-regulation and co-regulation as an example of that is a code of practice on disinformation that is currently being updated within the EU. And again, I, I see, Marco, that probably I need to stop talking now. Yeah, I would just I'll, say I'll... that what we will need in this area is a very uh, is, is a robust transparency before we apply any strict measures of that. So with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you very much for having me once again. Thank you very much, Lubos. And uh, in you also helped me to also insert again the element of regulation, but also something that I really appreciate. And uh, I mean, it's my profession to also do consumer protection because there is a pillar of legislation, but also the pillar of the role of consumers, an active role on the platform. This will help probably in the next, uh, in the next phases to rebalance and to help to reap all the benefit out of the experience in the, in, in the platform. If consumer will have an active role uh, with respect of their uh, uh, rights, but also economic interest, because let's not forget that the consumer contribute with their uh, personal data to the uh, existence of uh, this uh, experience in, the, in, those, uh, in, in, in such platform. Uh, Probably I can take your last words as your last comment, so I will uh, close with you. Uh, but instead, I, I have three minutes left, and I will go back uh, to Roberta and Francesca, Carolina, uh, and Giacomo to ask them uh, 30 seconds with the, their last thought uh, to be shared with our audience today. Roberta, Francesca? Yeah, very quickly. Uh, thank you. And uh, I just want to add that we have focused our, uh, our presentation on social practices, actual what people actually do. But of course, it will be really interesting to explore our topic, especially the topic of digital afterlife life under the, uh, the perspective that Lubus br brought in 
so the perspective of the triangulation of user platforms and and regulation because there is a lot of work to do on this side of what happens to people when they are dead but they are still on on platform absolutely and um, this triangle we have to to take in mind that is the, we need to make this triangle work for the benefit of uh, everybody it's not only regulation regulation will help but it's not uh, uh, self-standing. Roberta, do you want to add something on that? Yeah, no, I I leave time to, to other speakers. <laughs> okay, thank you, Roberta. Anyhow, you brought here very uh, interesting um, e e experience. Carolina. Um, I, I think, I think I've, I've talked enough, but I was interested in what Giacomo was saying um, on TikTok. I'm not a heavy TikTok user, but I get your um, remark about the fact that uh, you, 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 you consume, you are offered content that is not from your bubble, but at the same time, isn't there like an algorithm that still kind of knows what you are into? And have, well, I would like to ask you so many questions because I think TikTok is interesting, but my partner uses it. And sometimes I pick at his phone and he's looking at the weirdest thing ever. So yeah, it's just, I don't know. Thank you, Carolina. I think we cannot restart and we are at the end. Maybe Giacomo, you have 10 seconds. I believe we are already out of, uh, if you have any specific thought that you want to share. Uh, yeah, at this, uh... just to say that our uh, I'm, I'm not answering Carolina, unfortunately, but let's there certainly have this discussion offline. No, just to say that actually regarding the role of consumers, actually users have a very active role in our moderation process. In fact, when it happens that a video starts having many, many views, there is a check from our moderators before it becomes viral, just to check that the video is okay. And this check can be preceded and actually in 80% of the cases is by reports from users. So 80% of the videos that are, are about to get viral and don't, don't get viral because users report those videos, which proves how effective this mechanism is. Thank you, Giacomo, which brings me with the, the much uh, the, the biggest happiness that I can have to bring back to the user are the as the owners of the I would say not only unit, user user is uh, is more than user in this case because we are speaking about human experience here. They are human beings, they are person, and we need to protect them as a whole. Okay, and that's a challenge for our collective challenges that we have in this uh, in these ages. I didn't receive uh, um, uh, questions from uh, from the participants. Maybe they will come after. Uh, I, I hope you will be uh, ready to uh, eventually, even after the, the event, keep on sharing your thoughts. Uh, there was a, a request from Elisa to be to, to have your consent to use on Twitter your uh, um, uh, part of your presentation or images with comments from the organizers. And I believe uh, I see that there are no nobody saying no. So I I I I, I force a consent. No, it's a common consent. Uh, and with that, I thank you very much. Thank you all, and uh, uh, we go back to the plenary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's thank been you. a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye then.